Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of the MacBook Pro. This topic won last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way the voting polls will show up right in your activity feed, and you can let me know exactly what video you'd like to see next. Now, Apple has released all kinds of notebooks since the first Macintosh Portable in 1997, but we don't have time to cover every single model in this video, so we'll focus on the MacBook Pro and its predecessor, the PowerBook G4, since the two are very closely related. So the PowerBook G4 was introduced by Steve Jobs back in 2001 at the Macworld Expo and it was a huge release. It was the first time Apple used pure titanium metal in any of their products, a sharp contrast from the black plastic of the PowerBook G3. That of itself was such a cool concept that Apple included the word when naming it the Titanium PowerBook G4. The notebook was just one inch thick, which may not be impressive by today's standards, but the PowerBook G3 was 1.7 inches thick. So Apple had reduced the PowerBook's thickness by 40%, which was an incredible feat of engineering. It was also one of the first notebooks with a widescreen aspect ratio, which Apple marketed as an ultra widescreen display that measured 15.2 inches diagonally. It also featured a slot loading disk drive on the front rather than on the side which made inserting and removing disks more convenient when space was tight. Now although this notebook's official name was Titanium PowerBook G4, users nicknamed it TyBook, which went well with the lower end iBook. Now remember how I said that this was the first time Apple used titanium? Well, it was also their last. You see, the titanium metal was painted in order to give it a more attractive finish, and that paint would start to peel and bubble after extended use, especially around the trackpad and palm rest. But this wasn't the only problem. The hinge was made from plastic and became notorious for breaking even under typical use. And because the video cable was routed through the left side of the hinge, it was vulnerable to damage, causing random lines, a jumbled screen, or backlight issues. So while the titanium PowerBook G4 had some good qualities, Apple knew they had to make it much more durable, which they did two years later with the aluminum PowerBook G4. It was released in 2003 and not only brought a new design, but laid the foundation for Apple's notebook designs for the next five years. Even the keyboard was given a big upgrade. It was a silver aluminum instead of black plastic and featured backlighting, which was the first case of keyboard backlighting seen on a notebook computer. In addition to the 15-inch model, this release reintroduced the 12-inch notebook back into Apple's line which was missing since 1998. But they didn't stop there. For the first time ever, Apple offered a 17-inch model in their line of notebooks. Now, the transition from the PowerBook G4 to the MacBook Pro in the beginning of 2006 wasn't as dramatic as you might expect. The MacBook Pro used the same design as the PowerBook G4, so they weren't really distinguishable at first glance. But the MacBook Pro received some exciting updates that really modernized Apple's notebook line. Things like the MagSafe connector, which would safely detach from the notebook if its power cable was accidentally yanked out. Or the built-in iSight camera, which allowed for video conferencing and taking fun pictures in photo booths. On the inside, the MacBook Pro ran on the Intel Core processor instead of the PowerPC G4 chip, and the optical drive was reduced in size in order to fit into the slightly smaller MacBook Pro chassis, which meant it ran slower than in the PowerBook G4 and couldn't write to dual-layer DVDs. The 15-inch aluminum MacBook Pro model was released first, with the 17-inch model unveiled three months later. And Apple decided not to release the MacBook Pro in a 12-inch size, which disappointed some users who needed a Pro notebook in an ultra-portable design. Now this line received a series of spec bumps from 2006 to 2008, which included Intel Core 2 Duo processors, doubled memory capacity, FireWire 800 for the 15-inch model, an increase in hard drive capacity, new NVIDIA GeForce video cards, and LED display backlighting. But the MacBook Pro's big update wouldn't come until late 2008 at a press event in Apple's headquarters where they announced a new 15-inch MacBook Pro featuring what they called a precision aluminum unibody enclosure, which basically meant that the MacBook Pro's chassis was made from one piece of aluminum rather than multiple individual parts. This unibody design was made possible by innovations in the manufacturing process that helped make the MacBook Air possible. Designers also moved all the MacBook Pro's ports to the left side of the case and moved the optical drive from the front to the right side, similar to the MacBook. 
A cool power saving feature was that the MacBook Pro had two video cards, a powerful Nvidia GeForce 9600M GT and a more power efficient GeForce 9400M. And the notebook would switch between these video cards seamlessly depending on the task. Apple decided to remove the FireWire 400 port on this model, which was quite controversial, but the FireWire 800 port remained. And the original unibody MacBook Pro came with a user replaceable battery, which was estimated to provide five hours of use. Now the display had a high gloss finish thanks to the edge-to-edge -edge glass panel, but Apple still offered a matte option for those who preferred a non-reflective screen. The trackpad buttons were removed completely since the entire trackpad was clickable, but it was much harder to register a click near the top of the trackpad since that's where it was mounted. Removing the buttons also allowed the trackpad area to be much bigger, making multi-touch gestures more comfortable. The backlit keyboard went from silver aluminum back to black plastic with separated sunken keys designed to have a low profile for optimal thinness. So this unibody update in 2008 applied only to the 15-inch MacBook Pro. Apple continued to sell the previous generation 17-inch model until it was updated with the unibody design three months later. But the 17-inch model received a few changes that the 15-inch model didn't. First was a non-removable battery that was shaped and fitted into each laptop to maximize space. It also featured adaptive charging, which used a computer chip to optimize the charge flow to reduce wear and tear on the battery, extending its overall life to 1000 charge and discharge cycles rather than 300 cycles. And daily battery life was estimated to be 8 hours. At Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference in 2009, it was announced that the 13-inch unibody MacBook would be upgraded and rebranded as a MacBook Pro, leaving only the white polycarbonate model in the MacBook line. It was also announced that the entire MacBook Pro line would use the non-removable battery first introduced in the 17-inch model. With this new battery, the 13 and the 15-inch MacBook Pros would each have up to 7 hours of battery life, while the 17-inch kept its 8-hour capacity. Three years later, Apple gave the MacBook Pro its second big update, calling it the MacBook Pro with Retina Display. This new model featured a high-resolution 15.4-inch 2880x1800 pixel retina display with in-plane switching. It had more pixels than the 27-inch iMac display and an even wider color gamut. It also had a thinner MagSafe connector and ran on Intel's third-generation Core i7 processors. But now let's talk about what the MacBook Pro with Retina Display didn't include. The disk drive was dropped, which allowed this model to be just 0.71 inches thick. That's 25% thinner than its predecessor. It also didn't have an Ethernet port, FireWire 800 port, or a Kensington lock slot. And instead of a hard disk drive, the Retina model featured a solid state drive which was faster and more durable. Although this generation of MacBook Pros didn't have as many design changes as the last, there were a few minor changes made. The hinge was redesigned, the power button was moved from the upper right corner of the chassis to the keyboard where the disc eject button used to be. Also, the model name was no longer at the bottom of the screen bezel. Instead, it was moved to the underside of the chassis, similar to an iOS device. It was Apple's first notebook not to have its model name visible during use. It was also the first generation of MacBook Pros not to include a 17-inch model. A common criticism of these MacBook Pros was that they were less user upgradable than previous generations. This was due to the memory being soldered directly onto the logic board and therefore couldn't be upgraded after you bought it. The battery was glued into place and attempts to remove it may have destroyed the battery or even the trackpad. The entire case used proprietary penelope screws and couldn't be disassembled with standard tools. But while the battery was glued, recycling companies stated that the design was only mildly inconvenient and didn't hamper the recycling process. Four years later in 2016, Apple introduced the fourth generation of MacBook Pros whose main feature was something called the Touch Bar, a multi-touch enabled OLED strip built into the top of the keyboard in place of the function keys. But there was a 13-inch MacBook Pro model without this Touch Bar opting for traditional function keys instead. The Touch Bar models also featured a sapphire glass covered Touch ID sensor at the right end of the Touch Bar which doubled as a power button. The 4th gen MacBook Pros introduced a 2nd generation butterfly mechanism keyboard that provided more key travel than the first iteration on the Retina MacBook. The 13-inch MacBook Pro had a trackpad that was 46% larger than its predecessor, while the 15-inch model had a trackpad twice as large as the prior generation. 
These MacBook Pro models follow the same design language of the previous two generations with an all-metal aluminum unibody enclosure and separated black keys. There were quite a few design changes though, like a thinner chassis, thinner screen bezel, larger trackpad, the touch bar, and a butterfly keyboard with less key separation than previous models. The speaker grills were relocated to the sides of the keyboard on the 13-inch models, and this generation of MacBook Pro came in two colors, the traditional silver and a darker space gray color. The MacBook Pro model name returned to the bottom of the screen bezel after being absent from the previous generation. And as with the Retina MacBook, the new models replaced the backlit white Apple logo with a reflective metal inset Apple logo. Now this generation of MacBook Pros stirred up quite a bit of controversy. The first round of complaints were caused by its lack of ports. Like the Retina MacBook, the new MacBook Pros had only USB-C ports, so users had to buy and carry around different adapters to connect their peripherals. The second round of controversy was sparked by users experiencing much shorter battery life than Apple claimed. Even Consumer Reports didn't initially recommend the MacBook Pro, citing inconsistent and unpredictable battery life in its lab testing. However, Apple and Consumer Reports found that the results had been affected by a bug caused by disabling caching in Safari's developer tools. Consumer Reports performed the tests again with a patched Mac OS and retracted its original assessment, but Apple wasn't out of the woods yet. There was still one more problem the keyboard. A report by Apple Insider claimed that the updated butterfly keyboard failed twice as often as previous models, usually caused by dirt or small crumbs getting stuck beneath the keys. And because of the butterfly mechanism, users weren't able to remove the keys themselves like on previous models. In May 2018, two class action lawsuits were filed against Apple regarding the keyboard issue, with one alleging a constant threat of non-responsive keys and accompanying keyboard failure, and accusing Apple of not alerting consumers to the issue since some claimed that Apple knew about the keyboard's high failure rate before it was even released. Now these lawsuits are still ongoing, so we don't know the results, but we'll definitely keep an eye on them moving forward. So that is the history of the MacBook Pro. If you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. And before we end the video, I want to tell you guys about this giveaway iMobi is doing since they were kind enough to sponsor this video. An iPad and Google Home are up for grabs and you can find a link in the description to enter the giveaway for a chance to win. They're doing this to promote their new AnyTransfer cloud service that can manage all your cloud accounts like Google Drive and iCloud from one application. It's also very handy for syncing files across different cloud accounts and sending files to recipients that are too large for email. So if you want to enter the giveaway, click the link in the description and you'll find the directions. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.